Amen. We've been starting in Ephesians chapter 4, and that's where we're going to go this morning. Ephesians 4, verse 11. You're going to have to do something about the font up there because no human can read that. All right, thank you. And his gifts were varied. This is talking about Jesus Christ. It says his gifts were varied. He himself appointed and gave men to us, some to be apostles, special messengers, some to be prophets, inspired preachers and expounders, uh, some evangelists, preachers of the gospel, traveling missionaries, he says. Some pastors, shepherds of his flock and teachers. And uh, he gave these gifts. His intention, it says in verse 12, was the perfecting and full equipping of the saints, his consecrated people, that they should do the work of ministering towards building up Christ's body, the church. So in our kind of our church world, it's been to where people thought, well, the pastor builds the church. pastor don't build the church. That was never God's plan. The pastor builds the people. The people build the church. My job is to equip you, to help you to become strong to where your life begins to make an impact on the people that are around you and that you become conscious of the fact that you're here with a purpose. No matter what your vocation is, you need to bring godly purpose into it. You're around people. You say, well, man, I work in construction. You're around people all the time. Or maybe you work in some other field, but you're around people, and God has given you a purpose, and that's for you to make an impact on the people around you. You're supposed to be the light of the world. I said, you're supposed to be the light of the world. And the world's full of darkness, and people are supposed to be able to look at your life and say, hey, these people are different. There's something about them. And, and you don't even have to be somebody who's real outgoing or all that stuff. You just have to live right, set the right example, and as the Lord opens up opportunity, you have the right, you know, just tell what Jesus has done for you. And your life is meant to make an impact on others, and that's what we've been talking a while about. So we've been trying to focus on how we could make it easier for you because our mission statement has been reaching the lost, training the saints. Everybody say it out loud. Reaching the lost, training the saints. I want you to know what we're all about. We want to get lost people saved because that's why Jesus came. He loves them. No matter what kind of mess their life is in or how messed up they've made their life, Jesus loves them. He died for them. He wants them to come into his kingdom, and then he'll clean them up, and he'll get them all straightened out. But he loves them, and we need to make an impact on those people, so we want to reach the lost and then train the saints. In other words, the Bible says you need to grow up so you won't be tossed to and fro with winds of doctrine. One of the things that really irritates me as a pastor is I see people that get hooked into goofy doctrine. Next thing I know, they're off here being weirdos, doing w weird stuff because they didn't sit and listen enough and take heed to what was being taught, and they got hooked into somebody's goofy doctrine, and off they go. And so the Bible says in Ephesians, then you build them up so they don't get caught up in something else, that they don't get tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, but they can stay with the truth and then grow up and be like Jesus Christ. So <clears throat> we're asking, in fact, I don't know, I didn't think about it, but we have some little hand, uh, some rubber bands that we had made, bands to go on your wrist that say, be a bringer. Everybody say, be a bringer. And we're going to be passing those out. I guess we'll put them out. We didn't do it today. We should have done it today, but be a bringer. And, and it's just to remind you that that out of the 52 weeks in a year, we want you to bring somebody to church. Don't invite them to church, bring them. And we believe that if you bring them, and we're using that scripture, it says, compel them to come in that my house may be filled. That wasn't a suggestion. He said, compel them to come in. Compel them to come in. One translation says, drag them in. So out of the 52 weeks in a year, it's not too much to ask you to bring somebody with you two times. And some of you, you know, you have opportunity and or, or the personality type is such that you, you might you can do many times more than that. But if everybody brings two and tries to influence at least two individuals to come to church through the, the 52 weeks out of the year, uh, we will begin to grow much more than we have grown. We've always grown 7 to 10 percent a year. We want to we wanna multiply instead of just add. And you have a much better chance of having someone stay in church long enough to begin to grow up and see the benefits of Christianity and develop a relationship with Jesus if they know somebody in the church. So in order to do that, we want you to be a bringer. We want you to get involved in these equipped classes. And uh, we have one here if you're a new Christian, and I know we have new Christians all the time coming in. It's Christianity one-on-one. -on -one. I'll be teaching that, and it's just some of the basics. 
We have a, you know, all of these groups you need to find one. You can get plugged in before they're all full and then take advantage. We're going to be doing much more, much more activities like the ladies painting, the ladies going on trip, men's paintball. We're going to have camping, motorcycle rides. We're going to be doing a variety of different things where if you're involved in that activity, then you can invite somebody and, and that's kind of the first step to warming them up to finding out all Christians are not flaky and all Christians are not goofy and they don't all hate sinners. If Jesus loves them, we can love them too. Can I get an amen? And we need to have that kind of attitude. So we're in this. We want it to be more than a mission statement. We want to give you every opportunity and every strategy. We're going to be thinking about it. And however the Lord leads us, we're going to be trying to make it as easy for you as we can. Now, why is it so important? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. This applies to you and it applies to me. For we must all appear and be revealed as we are before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive his pay according to what he's done in his body, whether good or evil, considering what his purpose and motive have been, what he has achieved, been busy with, and given himself and his attention to accomplishing. So you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ just like I am. And I, I can just, I, I guarantee you that he's going to be asking you exactly what the scripture says. What has been your purpose in life? What has been your motive? What have you been busy with? What have you given yourself and your attention to accomplishing? And, and, and like I said, there can be many vocations, but you need to bring God's purpose into whatever your vocation. What is the reason you have the business to begin with? Why, why do you have it? Why do you want it? Well, I just want to be rich. Why? Why? What, what are you doing with it? Is it for you? No. You, what have you been busy with? What are you accomplishing? Who are you reaching? Who are you impacting with your life? What are you doing on your job? I'm just making a living. Well, you need to stop it, and you need to be somebody who is working for that employer, being a blessing to them, setting the right example, influencing the people around you, and then the Bible says work so you have to give and be a blessing to others. Can I get an amen? amen. So we need to all examine this because you and I are going to stand before Christ, and we want to be sure that that's going to be a great day for all of us. Now, in many cases, believers who know that they, what they should be doing, I'm not talking about ignorant ones, I'm talking about ones that know already this is how a husband should treat his wife, this is how a wife should be respectful and treat her husband, this is how we ought to raise our kids, this is how we ought to influence people around us, this is the behavior we, we need to have. In many cases, there are people that already kind of know that. This is what I should be doing. I want to have an impact. And they are sincere in that, but in many cases, the issue is not that they don't know. It's the issue becomes this, I can't. I try. I try to walk in love with my wife, and I don't. I try to control my temper, and I don't. I lose it. I try not to... to get drunk or stop drinking or I try to not look at pornography or I try to get rid of this habit or this addiction. I try, I want to be free from that, but I, I fail. And that, that becomes the issue for a lot of people. It's not that they don't know, it's that they don't seem to have the power to overcome these issues that, that are common to our culture. So how do you get strong and overcome those things to where your life really begins to have an impact because you live different than the people that you're around. And your life starts taking a dramatic change just like the people we saw up there. Your life begins to change. How? And so that's what really we're going to talk about today. Um, the good news is you don't have to stay to where you want to change, but you can't. You can get in the process of tremendous change, but it's going to take your faith. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 says... Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our flesh. The issue a lot of people face is, is they can't overcome the flesh, the world, or the devil. Some people are fighting all three. And the devil's taking, cleaning their clock, the world around them is influencing them, and then their flesh is dominating them, and they need victory over all of those things. How in the world do you get victory? It's going to be by your faith. One translation says, because every child of God is able to defeat the world and we win the victory over the world by means of our faith. Now, 
your faith is so important to having, that's how you get in the kingdom of God, and then that's how you're going to be victorious in your life with Christ. Now, in Philemon chapter, uh, well, there's only one chapter in the book of Philemon, but in verse 6, notice what it says here, that the communication of your faith, one translation says the sharing of your faith. That's what we're talking about. That the sharing of your faith may become what? Effectual, effective. Some people's sharing of their faith is not effective because the people look at them and say, yeah, you're, I mean, I see your life. Your life is a disaster, and you're wanting to tell me how great it is to follow Jesus. But it says that the sharing of your faith or the communication of your faith may become effectual. How? Listen, by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. What? By the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ, the New English Bible says that our union with Christ brings. You're going to have to acknowledge some good things that are in you in Christ. Not your faults, not your failures, not your past, not your weaknesses, not your sins, not your doubts, not your fears. But, but what is it that happened to you when you became in union with Jesus Christ? You know, Dad Hagen used to say this. He used to say, most Christians are sincere, but they are weak. They're sincere, but they're weak. And the reason they're weak is they've never went to the Bible, the New Covenant especially, to find out what does it say about them, and then to make that their confession, to start speaking that. Now, we finished last week with this scripture over in Romans 10, 9, and 10. Put it up there again. I just want to point this out real quick. Because a lot of people, we, get, we kind of get in a rut and we think we know what the Scripture says when really we don't really have the full picture of what's being said. Here in Romans 10, 9, and 10, you know, he's talking about how do you get in right standing with God by your faith apart from the law? He said God has revealed the way you get righteous apart from the law. And he says you, the righteousness which is of faith or the way you get in right standing with God by faith doesn't say Who's going to go into heaven to bring Christ down or go into the abyss to bring Christ up? But it says the word is near you. It's in your heart and it's in your mouth. That's what we're preaching. It's called the word of faith. Then he says this, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart. You don't have to see Jesus. don't have to bring him down. But you can believe something in your heart and say it with your mouth. That God raised Jesus from the dead. He says you'll be saved. And then the next verse says, because... With a heart, man believes, the inward man. And with a mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Now, if you've been in church much, when you read the word salvation, you just think about getting saved, becoming a child of God, and that's kind of where you go right there, boom. That's how you get saved. Well, what does the word here, see, we translate the Bible, the New Testament's translated from the Greek language into English. So sometimes it pays you to look a little bit and see, well, what is this word that they're, what does it mean to be saved? Well, of course, it means salvation, or that's how you get into the kingdom of God, but that's not all it means. This is the Greek word soteria here, and it's very interesting. If you have a Strong's Concordance or W. Vines, you can look it up yourself, but uh, the word uh, here in the Greek language that means salvation or soteria is the word rescue, our safety, our deliverance, our health, our salvation. The root word is sozo, and it means to heal, preserve, deliver, protect, to make, to do well, or to be whole. In fact, this is exactly the same word. You hear me preach out of Mark chapter 5, the woman with the issue of blood. And remember, she was for, for 12 years she was sick, and she touched Jesus' garment. The power of God went in her body, and she was healed. And he said, daughter... Thy faith hath made thee whole. Isn't that what he said? Thy faith hath made thee whole. The word whole, there's this word, salvation. Well, he was using it. Jesus was using it, saying healing. 
So the word salvation here where it says with the heart man believes and with the mouth confessions made unto salvation doesn't just mean that's how you get in the kingdom of God. It means the same principle applies to you being delivered and you being, you, you being set free and you being rescued and you being made to do well and you being healed. The same principle applies with the heart man believes and with the mouth confessions made unto salvation, deliverance, healing, whatever it is you need. But many Christians don't know that. And instead of using the same principle that got them in the kingdom of God, they just think, well, that was a one-time thing. I believed something about Jesus, and I confessed him, and then that was the end of it. No, it's supposed to be the way you live. That's why the Bible says the just shall live by faith. It's supposed to be the way you live. It's supposed to be how you live. Now notice over in Hebrews 4.14, notice what it says here. Hebrews 4.14, the Amplified Bible. Inasmuch then as we have a great high priest who's already ascended and passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us, how many of you in here are in us? Got a few, some of you are not sure. Okay, yeah. Let us hold fast our confession of faith in him. So this was written to believers, and he says you're supposed to be holding fast to something. He didn't say you just do this every blue moon. I, I mean, uh, we have all these floods in Houston and it's caused all these hurricanes and all. If the helicopter flies over and drops a rope ladder down and you start climbing and he says, man, hold fast. He doesn't mean hold fast for just a few minutes and then let go. You better hold on. Well, a lot of Christians in their life, they don't do this. They don't hold fast to their confession of faith in God. It's just they're busy, they forget, or they don't understand the importance of it, and so they don't do that. But if you're going to be strong, and, you're, and your life is really going to start changing and making a huge impact, <clears throat> you're going to have to hold fast to your confession of faith in Jesus Christ and in the Word of God. And so today, I'm just going to give you, really, there are four areas, and I'm going to be pretty quick about it. I'm just going to kind of read the Scripture and leave it to you. Later on, I'm going to put this either in a book form or I'm going to put it in a, <clears throat> a, a CD for you to listen to and try to give them out because I want to help you. But there are four areas that I have done for 30-something years. That's holding fast. That's holding on. And I, I believe these and I speak them because they're in the Scripture and it's really what the Bible says about me as a believer. And I don't let it go. I don't let it go because he told me to hold on, so that's exactly what I do. And if you will do this, I'm not talking about, well, I do that, you know, every two or three weeks, Pastor, I'll, I'll make a confession of faith, or when I'm at church, I do that. No, he said hold on to it. So this is not supposed to be something you let go. And so I'm going to kind of get you started. You can write it down, or you can listen to this online when it comes out. Write these scriptures down. If you begin to do this, I guarantee you something. I guarantee you, you will start growing spiritually and the inner man will start dominating the outward man in your life and start making an impact. If it don't matter to you, then don't do it. Just keep going on the road, whatever road you're going on. But if you want to grow and you want to really make an impact, and I believe the vast majority of you do, then you need to start believing and speaking what the Bible says about you. And here's the four areas. Number one is this, what Jesus did for us through his death and resurrection you got to hold on to that. What did Jesus do for you through his death and resurrection? One scripture that I like to use every day is 1 Peter 2, 24, where Peter writes about Jesus. Here's what he says about him. He says, he personally bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Did he do that? He personally bore our sins in his own body on the tree as on an altar, and he offered himself on it that we might die, cease to exist to sin, and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed. So you need to be holding on to that and saying, Jesus personally bore my sin in his own body to the tree. And when you start reading and understanding the New Testament, you see that he did this one time for everybody. He made one sacrifice for everybody. He atoned for everybody's sin 2,000 years ago. He personally bore your sin in his own body to the tree so you could be dead to sin now and you could live under righteousness or right standing with God by whose wounds you have been healed. 
and you need to hold fast to, to saying that's what God says about me. He bore my sin. I'm dead to sin now. So that's what I say every day. Jesus bore my sin. Sin has no power over me. I'm dead to sin and I'm living under righteousness. By his wounds I was healed. Then Hebrews 10, I like these scriptures here. Hebrews 10 verse 4 and 5. Notice what it says here. Because the blood of bulls and goats is powerless to take sins away, when he, Christ, entered into the world, notice, he said, sacrifices and offerings you've not desired, but instead you made ready a body for me to offer. So Jesus came and he, he offered his body to become a sacrifice. Verse 10, and in accordance with this will of God, we have been made holy, consecrated, and sanctified through the offering made once for all of the body of Jesus Christ, the anointed one. Well, a lot of Christians don't see themselves sanctified because they're looking at the outward man and they're thinking about what all they did and this is, you know, what about my faults and failures? Well, you don't get to be in right standing with God apart from faith. You don't get to be in right standing with God based on how good you are and what you did. They already tried that. And everybody sinned and everybody fell short. So God made a way where you could be in right standing with him that wasn't based on how good you are. It was based on how good Jesus was and Jesus' atoning sacrifice. And because he shed his blood, we have been made holy, Amen. consecrated, and sanctified. How? Through the offering made once for all of the body of Jesus Christ, the anointed one. So we've been made holy, consecrated, and sanctified. You need to hold fast to that. Say, well, Pastor, I don't feel like it. He didn't say, if thou feelest like it. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, notice how he said it over here. For he hath made him, he, God, has made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. I mean, if you just read the book of Hebrews in the Amplified Bible, it talks about how Jesus abolished sin by the sacrifice of himself. He made him to be sin for us or a sin offering for us, a body that was prepared for me to offer. He made him to be a sin offering for us who knew no sin. Why? So we could be made something. He wanted to make you something. What? The righteousness of God through him. So you've been made the righteousness of God. Now, if you want to act like the righteousness of God, you have to take advantage of it. And you take advantage of, of, of it by your believing and your speaking. And then that starts changing you to where your behavior changes. You'll start acting like the righteousness of God or somebody who's in right standing with God. So every day, I use this scripture. He made him to be sin for me. The devil says, well, you did this, you missed that, you know, you got mad, you blah, blah, blah. And I say, really, none of that, is, that's all beside the point. For he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin so I could be made the righteousness of God through him. And I've been made the righteousness of God in and through Jesus Christ. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. It's what Jesus' blood did for you that made you righteous, not what you've done. And you've got to get your faith in there, but it'll cause you to grow and you become strong when you start speaking and hold fast to what Jesus, through his death and resurrection, did for you. The second thing is this, who you are because you're in Christ. Who are you anyway? A lot of people are always just looking at the natural. Well, I'm so weak. You know, I'm the son of so-and-so. Well, wait a minute. What happened to you when you gave your life to Christ? What did God do for you? Who are you now because of Jesus Christ? Well, 2 Corinthians 5.17 is a favorite scripture of mine. It says, therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ like a tree and there's a branch and he says, when you give your life to Jesus, you're engrafted in Christ and it says you become a new creature altogether. The old, previous, moral and spiritual condition, you are a spirit. You have a soul, you live in a body. But that old man that was on the inside of you filled with death and sin because of Adam's fall, that old man passed away, it says. The old moral and spiritual conditions passed away. Behold, the fresh and the new has come. So now you're a new creation. One translation says a new species. I like another translation says you're a new being. Another translation says not merely a man altered, but a man remade. You've been remade on the inside. That's what Jesus meant when he said you must be born 
again. You're changed. You're, you're remade a new person in Christ Jesus. Well, if you want to act like a new person, then you can't go around thinking about all your mistakes and whatever you've done. A lot of Christians need to forget their past. A lot of them are trying to remember it. You need to forget it. Huh? And they're always moping around, well, you don't know what happened to me when I was a child. No, I don't know what happened to you. But the whole world's messed up. And there's been, maybe your life was more dysfunctional than somebody else's, but you can't be thinking about all the garbage that happened to you or what your parents did to you or what all your sins are and all the mistakes that you've made. you got to forget those things. Philippians chapter 3, the apostle Paul said, Hey, there's this one thing I do. I forget the things that are behind. Paul had a lot to forget, didn't he? I mean, he persecuted the church. He put people in jail. He was standing right there, influential when Stephen was stoned to death. And he said, there's something I do. I forget the things that are behind, and I press on towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. And you've got to forget about your mistakes and how you messed up. The devil wants to get you living in the past. He wants to get you looking at the outward man instead of the inward man who God made you. God made you a new creation in Christ. Old things are passed away and all things are become new. And you need to be believing and speaking and holding fast and get up every morning and look in the mirror and say, I'm a new creation. I'm a new person in Christ. I'm brand new. But you got to hold fast. And a lot of us don't. It's just like, you know, the only time you ever say anything good's in church. Well, you're not going to have what you just say in church. What are you saying on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday when, when life is going on around you? Are you holding fast to what God has done? Forget the garbage. Forget all the junk behind you. Reach forth. Begin to say what God's Word says. I like this scripture, Galatians 3.26. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You're a child of God. Really? You're really a child of God? Did God make the universe? Did he make the sun and the moon and the stars and all of these galaxies? Is his power immeasurable and unlimited? Is he this amazing being that can do anything? Yeah, and you're his child. Instead of you just thinking, well, I, do you think that he made you, went to all the trouble to send his son to die for you and made you a new creation and then he made you a new creation and that is so weak that on your life down here, you, you have to have your face rubbed in the mud and in the dirt and your butt kicked by the devil by habits and sins and you can't overcome it. He went to all the trouble to make you a new creature and he made you where you're going to live your life defeated. No. But most believers don't take advantage of the fact they're brand new and they're sons of God and children of God and because they don't hold fast to that confession, they don't act like it. The reality doesn't start taking hold in the way that they act and talk and live their life. That's why you got to hold fast. 1 John 3, I like these scriptures. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. You have a Father in heaven that loves you. I said he loves you, and he loves you more than anybody's ever loved you. And he loves you more than you've ever loved anybody. Did you ever have a child you loved or a grandchild you loved? Is there anybody you would have given your life for without a moment's hesitation? Well, God loves you a whole lot more than that because he gave the life of his son. And he let him nail him to a cross and spit in his face and abuse him and torture him to death and he stood there and let him do it because he wanted your sin to be atoned for. And when Jesus died, then the sky turned black and there was a great earthquake. I bet God was just shaking. But he was thinking about you. And he was thinking about how the devil stole your future and your life and dominated this race. And he said, I want them back. And the only way to get them back is I have to pay the penalty. He did it because he loved you more than you've ever loved anybody. And he cares about you and he loves you, but so much that he says he called you a son of God. 
You're actually a son of God. You're actually a child of God. God's your very own father. Everybody say it out loud. I'm a child of God. God is my very own father. And he loves you more than your earthly daddy did. He's your very own father. And you need to hold fast to saying that. Can I get an amen from you? Number three is this, what the Father God has done for us through Jesus Christ. I like this, Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Colossians 1, 12. What the Father God has done for us, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his Son. Well, I mean, are you holding fast to the fact you've been delivered from the power of darkness and you're translated into the kingdom of God's dear son? Instead of saying, you know, what is darkness? That means all of Satan's kingdom and all of the tentacles of death and all that Satan has wrought in the earth, that's the kingdom of darkness. And instead of talking about how weak you are and fearful and you can't overcome this, and I just don't know why I can't victory over this problem that I have. I've tried. Well, you're not holding fast to the fact you've been delivered by the Father from the kingdom and power of darkness. You're holding fast to your addiction or what it looks like or how you feel about it. But your job, your job is not to break the addiction. Your job is to just say, I am delivered from the power of darkness. Darkness and sin and Satan have no power over me. I'm in the kingdom of the Son of God. It's your job to believe that this is true and begin to speak it because you do believe the Bible. How many of you believe the Bible? Well, then you start acting like the Bible's true and say, according to the Bible, if you can't do anything else, according to the Bible, and I believe the Bible, Father, I want to thank you today. I'm delivered from all the kingdom and power of darkness, and I'm translated into the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ. I'm not going to be delivered someday. I'm delivered now. And you hold fast, and you begin to speak what God's Word says about it. Can I get an amen? What, what the Father has done for us through Jesus Christ. I like this. It says, the Rotherham tra- translation says, who's delivered us from the authority of darkness. The Berkeley translation says the control of darkness. The 20th century New Testament says the tyranny of darkness. Satan's a tyrant. The Taylor translation says, the darkness and gloom of Satan's kingdom. If you're living in gloom, uh, you're not holding fast to what God has done. And there's people, they they spend weeks and days and months and years living in gloom and depression. That's not scriptural. The Bible says that uh, weeping may endure for a night, But joy comes in the, some of you know the Bible a little bit. Weeping may endure for a night. He gives you 24. He says, I'm going to give you 24 hours. I'm going to let you weep for a night. I'm going to let you be sad. I'm going to let you be sorry. Call your friends. Play some country and western music. You got 24 hours to do it. Get them all in here. Play that old whining music. Feel sorry for yourself. You got 24 hours. You can weep tonight. But in the morning when the sun comes up, joy better be there. Joy comes in the morning. So you're not supposed to be living a life of gloom and doom and depression and fear. Can I get an amen from you? And you need to be holding fast saying, God, I thank you, I praise you, and I worship you. Um, I like this, Galatians 4, verse 6 and 7. We're talking about what the Father did for you. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his Son into your heart crying, Abba, Father. He sent forth the spirit of his son, Jesus, where you could cry, Abba, that means like in our language, Daddy. And he wants you to be able to come before God just like he's your daddy. Then he says, therefore, you are no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You're a child of God, you're a son of God, you're an heir of God, and God owns it all through Jesus Christ. And you need to start believing and speaking. When the devil's telling you you're not going to make it, you're going broke, this is going to happen, you need to say, wait a minute. 
my God owns everything. The earth and the fullness thereof is the, is the Lord's. I'm a child of God. I'm an heir of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a son of God, and my father takes care of his kids in grand style. Can I get an amen from you? We've got a good father, and he knows how to do whatever you need done if you'll get your confidence and your faith in him and get it out of your mouth. You know, I was reading, I thought this was kind of funny, about a, a group. They were doing a tour in France at the Louvre, and they were having an art show. They're real artsy in France. <clears throat> Not good at much of it. Anyway, never mind about that. They're doing all of this, or they had this big art show going on, and so they had, uh, they had a tour, and they're going through looking at all these paintings, and they get to one painting. It's pretty famous. I looked the painting up to see what it looked like, and uh, <clears throat> it's called Checkmate name of the painting. And in the painting, they've got a man sitting over here. He's playing chess with the devil. The devil's over here. Some of you may have seen the painting. It says checkmate. And the man's got his face in his hands, and it says checkmate, and the devil's sitting over there, and he's laughing. And so they're, they're, this tour group is going through, looking at all of these paintings. And in the tour group, they had a chess master who was there. Oh, grand master, whatever they call him. This guy's good chess, Okay. So they look at that, and he looks at a minute, and he says, I I'm going to look at this a few minutes. So they went on. <clears throat> so he's standing there looking. Well, a few minutes, they came back, and he's still standing there. And he's, he's looking at that, and he said, uh, you're going to have to either call the person that painted this, and they're going to have to change it, or they're going to have to change the title because I've been looking at the chessboard in the painting, and the king still has one more move. I thought, the king, king has one more move. Everybody say the king has one more move. You see, the devil's always thought he's got you in checkmate, but let me tell you something, the king's got one more move. King's always got one more move. See, when Moses came out of the land of Egypt and he had the children of Israel with him and they got down to the Red Sea and it looked like Pharaoh was going to kill them all, guess what? The king had one more move. I mean, when they put... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. It looked like it was over and lights were out. But let me tell you something. The king had one more move. And Jesus, when they nailed him to the cross and they crucified him and they, they tortured him to death, it looked like it was all over, but the king had one more move. And the same thing is true in your life. I mean, when it looks like there's no way out of this, there's nothing I can do. you got a God that can do anything, and there is nothing impossible with God. The king has got one more move for you. Hallelujah. Give the Lord some praise for that. The king's got one more move. Just turn your name and say, the king's got one more move. The last thing is this. Here it is what we can do with God in us, what we can do. A lot of people, they don't have any problem believing God's got power, but they forget that God did something for them. And scriptures like Philippians 4, 13, I can do all, I, I can, he said. I can do all things. Oh, it's not because of you naturally, but he says through Christ who strengthens me. Are you holding fast to that? Or are you talking about how weak you feel and how, well, I don't know what to do. How many Christians you hear saying all the time, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, you need to start saying, I can do all things through Christ. In my natural mind, I may not know what to do in this circumstance, but I can do all things through Christ. Christ is the strength of my life. He strengthens me. And he's going to put me over. I can do all things through Christ. He strengthens me. Christ dwells. He actually lives and dwells in us by the power of his Holy Spirit. And we can do it through Christ. I like Mark chapter 16, verse 17 and 18, because it was written to believers. And these signs shall follow them that believe. How many of you in here are believers? But you know what? Most believers never say this. They don't hold fast to that. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. A literal translation should read, In my name shall they exercise authority over devils. They'll speak with new tongues. I speak in tongues every day. I say, Pastor, you're a weirdo. No, I'm not a weirdo. You're a weirdo. If you don't speak in tongues, you're a weirdo, weirdo. 
In my name shall they cast out devils. They'll speak in new tongues. They'll take up serpents. It doesn't mean you play with snakes. It means if you get accidentally bit, you can claim immunity in the name of Jesus. And it says they'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Well, what do you say about it? Well, I would never say that. Okay, you'll never have it then. Because it's what the heart man believes and what the mouth confessions made unto. So I say in the name of Jesus, I cast out devils. And I do. And I'm glad I found out about it. I'm glad I found out we had authority over demons and evil spirits because they're down here. You may think, well, they're all herded up over in Africa. No, they're not. What about Luke 10, verse 17, 19? And the 70 returned unto him with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. The Bible teaches there's, there's demons, evil spirits, devils. Jesus said, and I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. I saw that, he said. And behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over half of the power of the enemy. How much? All the power of the enemy. All of it. All of it. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. So you need to hold fast to that and say, I've got authority in the name of Jesus. I cast out devils. I've got authority. I've got power over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt me. Because I tell you what, you've got an adversary and he's going to try to do it. And if you've just been playing religion instead of walking with God and believing what he said, you're going to have a rough time dealing when you get an attack of the enemy. See, I remember, I guess it was 1984, and uh, I'd already been studying some of these things and learning and growing and found out about the authority in the name of Jesus. Philippians 2, 9, 10 says the name of Jesus is above every name. And I was familiar with this scripture here in Mark 16. In my name shall they cast out devils. And <clears throat> I remember Velda telling me, Jessica, our youngest daughter, she was, I guess she was about one, whatever. About, she was just a little bitty, just walking. And <clears throat> so Velda calls me at work and said, well, Jessica just passed out. She just fell on the floor and was unconscious. And I got her back and you know scared her and so I think it happened again and so you know I prayed for her as far as God I thought it was healing she needed I, I didn't know we didn't know of anything causing it but it really concerned me the reason it did is I had a first cousin who was a few years older than me and that would happen to her and she would just I remember you know we'd be over visiting her house holidays or something she'd be standing I mean she's a grown woman and she would just collapse. Her knees would buckle. She'd fall. I remember one time she hit a lamp and just fell and just the floor. They finally got her conscious. And eventually, I mean, she was going to the doctor. They're trying to find out why in the world is she collapsing like this, just passing out. They ne I mean, she's on medicine. They never got it. And, and she ended up dying. She just fell and hit her head and died from it. So the devil's telling me, well, see, your daughter, <clears throat> she got the same thing your cousin had in my mind. I said, no, no, she ain't. She ain't got it, and she ain't going to have it. The name of Jesus is bigger than any of that stuff. So I'm at home one day, and I'm sitting on the couch, and, and Jessica comes running out of the room, and she comes in the living room there, and she's just playing or whatever, and all of a sudden she just, her eyes roll back in her head, and boom, she hits the floor. And <clears throat> it made me mad. I'm just telling when I found When I found out there's a devil, and he comes to steal, kill, and destroy... I mean, it makes me mad. I don't want somebody messing with me and mine. And I grabbed my daughter up, and I said, Devil, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, come out! And I mean, her eyes opened up and fluttered her eyes like that. She was all right and went and played. Well, several months later, a few months later, same thing happened. I'm at home. Same thing happens again. Eyes roll back in her head. Boom, she hits the ground. I picked her up, and I ran into the bedroom in there so I could holler a little bit louder. And I said, devil, I've already told you, you're not doing this. I'm not taking this. You're not attacking my daughter this way. In the name of Jesus, come out and don't you ever come back again. And that's been 30 so long years, and uh, it's never happened again. Can I get an amen from you? But, but you got to know that there's authority and power in the name of Jesus. You can do it. In my name, he said, shall they. How many of you in here are they? In my name shall they cast out devils so you don't have to run from the devil. You've got authority over devils. You've got authority through the name of Jesus and you don't have to be afraid of the devil or circumstances 
Because if you'll hold fast to what the Scripture says about you, it'll cause your life to make a huge impact on the people that are around you. And it brings this amazing peace and this amazing joy and this amazing confidence knowing God's with me. God's with me. He lives in me. He dwells in me. Greater is he that's in me than any circumstance, than any test, than any trial. I'm never alone. God dwells in me, and he's with me. Can I get an amen from you?